I will talk about uh, misinformation from a uh, slightly more uh, systemic uh, perspective, because I believe uh, it's actually quite interesting to, to view the problem of uh, misinformation as something that follows from the dynamics of uh, late modernity. Uh, so what, it, what is these dynamics of late modernity? Uh, these are just some of the well-known books that dis discuss it, and, and these are uh, some of the basic, basic features. So uh, late modernity is, is the age of globalization, it's the end of the national state era. Uh, it's, uh, uh, a typical feature is, is a rejection of large bureaucratic institutions, such as the welfare state or, or uh, the, the large uh, uh, companies of the Fordist type where you expect it to, uh, uh, to work all your life. Uh, <clears throat> Competition and, and permanent change, uh, horizontal networks instead of hierarchies, uh, <clears throat> short-term projects instead of long-term stability, and, and last but not least, stress on flexibility, mobility, and creativity. Now, these are all very well-known features. I, I, I won't uh, go into them, uh, and this will be just just the background of, of my lecture. Uh, I would like to focus on. Uh, <clears throat> several other features which are perhaps uh, not so well known. Uh, one of them is that uh, late modernity is uh, also the age of authenticity, uh, which is a conception put forward by uh, the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor. Uh, and it's something that is, is not difficult to see because uh, uh, we're all surrounded by this authenticity uh, claim. We, we all want to be authentic. I mean, lifestyle magazines keep on urging us to, to be authentic. Uh, it's important in, in marketing. Marketing has to be authentic to, to, to work, to impress the, the audience. Uh, leadership needs to be authentic. Uh, we need th those charismatic leaders like Steve Jobs and, and, and guys like that. Uh, Businesses should be run in an authentic way, and, 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 and so on. So this discourse of authenticity is, is really all pervasive in, in our culture. Uh, as Charles Taylor shows, uh, it's something that originally started long ago uh, with, with the Romantics, but for a long time this was just, just an elite thing, mainly among artists who, uh, who valued authenticity. And it was only at the end of the 60s that it became uh, a massive phenomenon. Uh, <clears throat> now, this, this phenomenon of authenticity is connected with another phenomenon, and th that is uh, uh, charismatic authority. Uh, this, this is something that, that, that I have from, from this guy, uh, Francois Gautier. Uh, now, as, as we know, uh, the German sociologist Max Weber distinguished three types of authority, traditional, uh, legal, rational, and, and charismatic. Uh, <clears throat> and he claimed that modernity is based on the, the legal, rational type of authority. That is uh, the type of authority that, that uh, relies on impersonal laws and uh, bureaucratic uh, institutions. Uh, <clears throat> and Weber thought that, that this type of authority would be stronger and, and stronger as, as modernity would, would proceed. Uh, but he underestimated the charismatic authority, which he, he knew, but he thought it, this, this was just a transient thing in, in times of change for a short time. You've got a charismatic authority, which, which quickly needs to be stabilized and, and routinized. Uh, <clears throat> but in fact, in, in late modernity, some, something else happened because uh, with the stress of authenticity, uh, <clears throat> we've experienced a crisis of these bureaucratic uh, uh, impersonal institutions. These, these institutions suddenly seem as inauthentic, as, as alienating, as something that is difficult to, to, to relate to. Uh, and as a result, even these bureaucratic institutions nowadays have to have recourse uh, to charismatic uh, authority. So that to, to give you just, just a couple of examples, one, one, one area where, where we can see this clearly is, is the crisis of traditional political parties. Traditional political parties 
uh, are a good example of, of these uh, modern bureaucratic institutions based on legal rational authority. Uh, traditional parties were really large institutions with complicated bureaucratic processes for, for making decisions and uh, <clears throat> Uh, with complicated rules and and so on, and uh, uh, with political programs that that were stable more, more or less in 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 in, in long term. Uh, now, with the advent of of late modernity, this just just stopped working. Uh, uh, <clears throat> people just no longer found this this authentic. Instead. Uh, we've seen a proliferation of various political movements as opposed to parties. A party is a bureaucratic institution, which is not very flexible. A movement is, is very flexible. It's something that, that uh, <clears throat> uh, it doesn't have this, this complicated bureaucratic structure. And, and uh, movements are much less stable. They, they come and go. They're, they're like waves that, that, that just appear and, uh, and vanish. But they can have great charismatic effects. Effect. So in my country, for instance, there, uh, uh, there keep on emerging these, these political movements that, that usually succeed in, in one election, then fade away, and another movement appears, and, uh, <clears throat> and so on. And the political parties are so threat threatened by, by this that they do nowadays have to have recourse uh, to various uh, charismatic procedures. So uh, <clears throat> uh, they, they have to use complicated marketing strategies and, and uh, they have to do something that I call Facebook politics. So uh, uh, when they make political decisions, uh, one of the main uh, criteria they, they have is, is that, that these decisions have to resonate on, on Facebook to, to, to get as many likes as, as possible, uh, <clears throat> which changes these, these parties greatly. So that's just one example of, of the spread of charismatic authority. Uh, another example is, is that governments nowadays make, make use of sophisticating marketing strategies. When a government makes a decision, uh, they also need to hire marketing experts to, to uh, advertise this, this decision as, as if the citizens were uh, really the customers of, of, of the government who have to buy this, this, this product of, of governmental this decision, and, and it's become quite normal these days. Uh, <clears throat> one last example is that uh, states nowadays uh, increasingly rely on, on various NGOs, for instance, uh, uh, <clears throat> in various social uh, and welfare activities. What, what used to be done directly by the welfare state is nowadays uh, more and more frequently outsourced to, to, to various uh, and NGOs, uh, uh, which are engaged in, 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 in social services and care for the elderly, and, and, and uh, frequently they run hospitals and, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's again because these NGOs are uh, charismatic. Uh, you work in an NGO because you have a passion for the thing that, that, that they do, and uh, you're not, not expected to work there uh, for 20 years. It's, it's just, just this, this passing uh, thing that runs on, on, on the temporary charisma. Uh, <clears throat> so the, these are just, just a couple of examples. Uh, <clears throat> now, Closer to, to, to our main subject, this, this uh, has a very interesting consequence in that it leads to a new conception of, of truth, which, uh, uh, which is frequently called post-truth, but I don't think this, this is the right thing to call it because po post-truth implies that there is no truth any longer. I don't think this, this is true. I think uh, it, it's rather that, that uh, we now have a slightly different kind of, of truth. Because under legal rational authority, uh, the guarantors of truth were uh, institutions uh, with their rationally set rules for distinguishing truth uh, from falsehood. So for instance, science with, with a scientific method and, and uh, it's peer review process, so that's one such bureaucratic institution for, for <clears throat> uh, deciding what is true and, and, and what is not. Or uh, traditional printed media, which also had uh, various rules for verifying uh, <clears throat> in, in information. Uh, and 
the stress was on the facts that were guaranteed by uh, uh, these institutions. And this, this is important to, to, to stress, this, this, this guarantee, because all, all facts are, uh, to some extent, socially con constructed. Uh, there are no pure facts. The, the facts are always socially mediated. And as long as we uh, trusted these institutions, there was, there was no problem with this. Uh, but when these institutions started to swim inauthentic, uh, uh, then for many people, uh, even the facts ceased to be trustworthy. And as a result, a new conception of truth emerged because un under charismatic authority, the focus shifts from facts uh, to various uh, emotion-filled narratives, which we take to be true uh, when they resonate with us, when they make us feel authentic. Uh, and at first sight, this, this might seem as a, as a caricature of truth, as something that, that is not worthy of, of uh, uh, being, being designed as, as, as truth, but, but I don't think this, this is a good perspective. Uh, uh, this this post-fact truth is not necessarily a, a worst kind of truth. It's, it's a different kind of truth. It's, it's like uh, <clears throat> saying that emotions are worse than rational arguments. I don't think we can, we can say this. Uh, they're just different, and, and uh, it's important to uh, have both rational arguments and emotions. So uh, <clears throat> I certainly don't wish to devalue this, uh, this charismatic type of truth. I just think uh, we need to uh, uh, <clears throat> take notice of it and uh, we should be careful to distinguish these, these two kinds, which frequently we, we do not, which is uh, what happens often in uh, uh, precisely in the in the field for, of uh, fighting uh, misinformation, uh, <clears throat> uh, where uh, some common mistakes are, are in in my view uh, frequently made. Uh, <clears throat> one concerns the fact that in my view most misinformation narratives are really about feelings uh, and not uh, about facts. Uh, which means that debunking them has, has little effect. For, for instance, in my country, there are, there are many misinformation narratives concerning the European Union, uh, which are anti-European, and they are frequently based on some uh, claims which uh, resemble facts, and what, what fact-checkers frequently do is that they start to debunk the, these claims, so they, they start to explain that this particular European law was misunderstood and it doesn't really imply what, what this narrative says it, it implies. Uh, but this doesn't really change anything. It, it, I don't think it can persuade anyone that, that <clears throat> the narrative is not true. Uh, what usually happens is that uh, people give up this particular uh, this, this, this particular factive anchor of, 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 uh, of the narrative, and they shift to some, some other an anchor, or they need no anchor at all. They, they are just angry at, at the uh, European Union. Uh, <clears throat> and in fact, in these cases, I think we should rather ask what feelings these narratives reflect and how these feelings uh, arise. Uh, and I think in most cases we'll actually find out that these feelings are uh, not really directly connected to the uh, content of the narrative. So, for instance, to, to, to the uh, issue of, of the European Union, uh, because as, as we've already heard uh, today, the content shifts quite frequently. Uh, the narrative may concern climatic change or COVID vaccination or the, the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, and what's Constant is, is the feelings and not the content of the relatives, of, of the narrative. So it's really quite, quite useless to, to, to debunk the, uh, <clears throat> the content and we should rather study uh, the feelings. And I think in most cases we'll, we'll find that, that the feelings are connected with some more general structural uh, features of, of late modernity. And, and that uh, the anger against the European Union, for instance, is just a manifestation of, of this much more general discontent that, that these, these people experience. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> another thing is that the fact checkers themselves frequently mix factic and, and charismatic truth, which is very important to, to stress because normally the fact checkers uh, pretend that, that they are the experts on, on facts as they really are, whereas the misinformation narratives are uh, <clears throat> get, get the facts wrong. But in fact, when, when we study the fact checkers, we can see that uh, even they are actually uh, much more frequently concerned with narratives and their emotional implications than uh, <clears throat> with, with facts as, as such. Uh, so that many of them are rather narrative checkers sticking to various ideological criteria that allow them to distinguish uh, good narratives from dangerous ones. Uh, <clears throat> some check fact checkers nowadays admit this quite openly. They, they no longer talk about fact checking and, and they, uh, uh, they talk, they, they compile lists of dangerous narratives, but that, that, that means that, that uh, <clears throat> they actually admit that, that we have shifted from the verification of facts altogether and that, that it's about something uh, <clears throat> completely different. And, and most of the, these narratives are not verifiable in, in empirical terms. I mean, when, when you get an uh, anti-European narratives, uh, this is something that cannot be confirmed or debunked, it's, it's, uh, it, it either confirms your feelings or it goes against them. Uh, <clears throat> a third point is that even legal rational truth nowadays acts in close alliance with charismatic truth. Legal rational truth is so weak these, these, these days uh, that it also needs various marketing procedures uh, uh, to be to be successful. This is something, for instance, that, that we could see uh, during the COVID pandemic uh, in the way scientific views uh, were communicated. Uh, and these, these ways were uh, uh, quite strongly charismatic. I mean, some of the best known scientists who communicated these, these, these views were uh, strongly charismatic figures. So, for instance, in my country, one of the most uh, visible scientist that, that influenced the, the uh, COVID discourse uh, was this guy, uh, <clears throat> uh, who's a professor of biology at Charles Un Un University, and he uh, <clears throat> uh, consciously played the part of, of the mad scientist, uh, making these, these photos of himself, and most of the advice on COVID uh, uh, was, was presented on Facebook in the form of his talks to his cat and, and, and so on. So, so uh, th this was a uh, sophisticated marketing pr pr procedure, uh, <clears throat> and it was all based on, on charismatic authority, although it, it, it claimed to be uh, based on scientific facts, but these were sort of in, in the background and, and the charisma was, was much, much more important. Uh, <clears throat> and I think it's, it's really important to realize that, that this, this mixing of, of those two kinds of truths is just unavoidable uh, uh, today. It's not something that we can easily get, get rid of. Uh, <clears throat> now, one last uh, uh, point that, uh, that I would like to make concerning the dynamics of, of the late modern system uh, concerns the, uh, something that, that we might call di digital jungle. What, what, what do I mean by, <clears throat> by this? The, uh, the erosion of legal rational authority is closely linked with the rise of social media, which uh, of course favor charismatic authority, which is measured by the number of likes that, 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 that you get. Uh, <clears throat> so the social media are, are really de designed to, to uh, arouse your em emotions and make you re re react. And at the same time, the social media allow to bypass uh, traditional media institutions. So uh, 20 years ago, uh, uh, we were all reading newspapers and that, that was the main main source of information. Nowadays, we can, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, we can read all sorts of narratives on, on social media. Uh, now, I don't uh, 
at least in, in, in Czech political discourse, it's, it's frequently claimed that the social media are the cause of, of this erosion of uh, legal rational authority. I don't actually think this, this is the case. I think it's, it's, it's really just a manifestation of, of this, this erosion and that the causes are, are more complicated and, and systemic. Uh, and this results in a different narrative ecosystem. This, this is a concept that, that I've borrowed from, from this guy, the, the Greek British sociologist Yanis Gabriel, uh, who calls it narrative ecologies, uh, namely spaces where different narratives and, and counter narratives emerge, interact, compete, adapt, develop, and die. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, uh, Gabriel studies uh, the narrative space uh, of contemporary culture as, as uh, uh, something that is uh, analogous to a, uh, an ecosystem in in nature where different species, in this case different narrative species, interact. Uh, and in this interaction they, they, they uh, react to each other and, and the result is a, is a <clears throat> uh, system that, that can be described as a, as, as a whole. And Gabriel claims that uh, we are now witnessing a fundamental change in, in this narrative ecosystem because until recently uh, we lived in something that he calls a, a narrative temperate zone where uh, different narratives co coexisted in a relatively stable manner. Some were dominant, some were marginal, but even the marginal narratives were relatively uh, stable and they were not really very dangerous. So we had, we had some, let's say, alt-right narratives, but, but they, they just formed a relatively stable part of, of mm -mm. Uh, modern political culture, and, and uh, <clears throat> they were just confined to, to these, these mar marginal areas. Uh, Gabriel claims that uh, with the advent of, of the social media, uh, what we can witness is, is what he calls a narrative jungle, rather, where uh, many narratives start to aggressively compete for, for, for attention, and frequently they are, they are just short-lived. They, 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 they are going viral, uh, so for a week, everyone discusses this particular issue on, on, on Facebook. There, there is this, this one narrative that everyone is interested in, and then it just, just fades out. And, and in one month, you, you no longer think about it. And, and uh, it's <clears throat> as if the narrative never, never existed. So, so there is this, this rapid change, which, which is connected with one of the features of late modernity that, that I presented in my, uh, in my first, first slide. Uh, and this, of course, destabilizes the, the, the narrative system. Uh, uh, the, 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 the temperate system was, was very predictable and uh, it seemed very safe, whereas this, this one is sort of, it, it keeps on changing and, and uh, it's, it's very aggressive occasionally. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, as a result, there is a counter, counter reaction uh, uh, and there is a fight to save the, the temperate mainstream. Uh, uh, fact checkers, in my country at least, see themselves as, as the last defenders of, of this, uh, this good uh, liberal democratic temperate mainstream, uh, <clears throat> and they believe they should do everything that is in their power to protect it from, from the dangerous attacks of those uh, viral uh, anti-systemic narratives. Uh, and so we see an, a tendency to, to protect the remnants of the temperate system by uh, erecting a wall around it and keeping out all, all the destabilizing uh, invasive narratives, which, which are invasive in, in, in a similar sense as, as biological species might be invasive. So, so they are seen as something that once it... Uh, uh, <clears throat> enters the system, suddenly s s s starts to uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 to proliferate and it, uh, uh, it endangers the, the entire system if, if we don't stop it. So this, this is uh, how, in my country at least, m misinformation is, 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 is frequently, uh, frequently views, uh, viewed as, as some uh, dangerous anti-systemic power trying to, to infiltrate 
uh, <clears throat> the system and, and, and destroy it. And, uh, and all we can do according to, to, uh, to the fact checkers is uh, uh, to build, build solid walls around the system and, and, and not let this, uh, this dangerous misinformation in. Uh, <clears throat> and in my country, this, this is really the, the dominant view of, uh, of misinformation that, that, we, uh, uh, that we now have. Uh, and it's uh, quite typical that in my country, it's not actually called misinformation, it's, 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 called, uh, it's called disinformation. Uh, that is, uh, 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 it's, it's taken for granted that, that there is a malicious intent behind this, this uh, uh, attack. Uh, I haven't seen it in, in, in Western countries, for instance. I think in most Western countries, it's, it's called misinformation. But here, uh, misinformation is never used. It's always disinformation. Uh, <clears throat> now, I think this, this is some dangerous unintended effects because one, one such effect is that uh, more and more narratives are being excluded as potentially destabilizing. Uh, this is something, for instance, that, that we could see in, during, during the COVID pandemic, uh, where uh, the COVID pandemic ge generated a, a, a large range of different views, uh, and some of it were, were extreme. On, 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 on the one hand, you, you had people who thought vaccination should be compulsory and, and we should just, just vaccinate everyone against their will. On, on the other hand, you, you had people who believed there are uh, chips in vaccines and, and, and so on. But in between, there, there were uh, various intermediate positions. Uh, and normally, uh, we would take these intermediate positions as more or less acceptable, and we, we would just deal with, with those, uh, those extremes and conspiracy narratives and, and so on. But what has happened during the pandemic is that the range of acceptable views was extremely narrow. Uh, basically, you uh, had to agree that uh, ideally we should vaccinate everyone. That was the only acceptable view. Uh, when you try to uh, uh, claim that, for instance, we can only vaccinate the risk groups or that people who have already had the disease uh, no longer need the, the vaccination, this, this was not seen as a legitimate view. So this, this was pushed outside uh, the walls that were being erected around, uh, uh, <clears throat> around the legitimate uh, system. Uh, and this leads to another unpleasant consequence because by excluding these narratives, you exclude the people uh, who believe in these narratives as well. So, so you, you start excluding uh, one part of the population uh, because normally the, the narratives are the thing through which people identify uh, with the social order. So when your narrative is present in the public discussion and it's uh, framed as, uh, as a legitimate narrative that may enter the, the discussion, then you may identify with this public discussion and with, with the, the whole social order. When your uh, narrative is labeled as dangerous and illegitimate, then it means that you are yourself labeled as dangerous and uh, <clears throat> illegitimate. So we're excluding these, these people from our uh, society. And at the same time, in my country, uh, at least, these invasive narratives are portrayed as coming uh, from our external enemies, uh, typically from uh, Putin's Russia. Uh, <clears throat> and so it's, it's uh, frequently claimed that, that it's really some Russian trolls who spread them all. Uh, <clears throat> uh, it's called the hybrid warfare, and, and uh, uh, two colleagues of mine, two Czech colleagues of mine, have recently published this marvelous book that, that tries to dismantle the, the hybrid warfare narrative and show that the uh, in, 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 fact, in fact, empirical research does not confirm this, this idea that uh, <clears throat> those, those uh, Russian troll farms would be so important and, and that 99% of uh, misinformation is generated from within the system by, by people living in our country. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, we label these people as, as sort of Putin's agents and we exclude them from uh, legitimate dis discussion. Uh, and that means that the mainstream is getting narrower, whereas the anti-system is growing. Because of, by excluding these people, we're sort of pushing them into 
uh, into the anti-system. And that's quite dangerous because these people are still are co-citizens and they have their voting rights. Uh, and so in, in, in these people, in, in, in this way, we are uh, pushing them into the arms of some, some populists who might, uh, <clears throat> might be interested in their votes. Uh, <clears throat> So that's, that's my diagnosis. And now uh, what uh, can be done about this? Uh, the first crucial point is that, uh, uh, in my opinion, there are no easy solutions. So, so ultimately, uh, we have to learn uh, to, to live with, with, with these invasion, uh, invasive narratives and, 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 and with, the, with the narrative jungle. There is, mm, uh, <clears throat> uh, no easy way uh, to get out of it. Uh, I certainly don't think that erecting walls can help. Uh, on, on the contrary, I believe that, that, that uh, this is just making things uh, uh, worse than, than, than they were. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I believe a solution is not a narrower mainstream, but a mainstream that is more resilient. And <clears throat> uh, what, what do I mean by, by, by this? Uh, in Czech society, these, these days, you, you commonly encounter the, the idea that resilience means that we should all rally around uh, one opinion and, and uh, <clears throat> just think the same, uh, same things. So for instance, during the COVID pandemic, it's, 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 uh, <clears throat> it was claimed that, that uh, this wide range of opinions is, is dangerous and that we need uh, as few uh, legitimate opinions as, as possible and that we should all agree upon them and that, and that this is what will save us in, in the pandemic. I, I don't think this, this, this actually works. This just has the effect of uh, <clears throat> pushing uh, some people into, into the anti-system. Uh, I think that the very opposite is, is true, in fact, that resi resilience consists in greater inclusion, in, in, in keeping the zone of legitimacy as wide uh, as, <clears throat> as, as possible, not in uh, keeping a large part of the country out, but in, in trying to include as many people uh, as, as, as possible. And therefore that we should search for ways to integrate even some mildly uh, anti-systemic narratives. Uh, because these days it's, it's presented as if holding an anti-systemic narrative means uh, fundamentally endangering the democratic order. So for instance, when you hold an, uh, a conspiracy theory, you are seen as, as the arch enemy that, that, that is really threatening uh, <clears throat> our democratic society. Uh, now, uh, me and my students have actually done some research of uh, conspiracy theories uh, by talking to actual living people. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, we haven't found a single one of them that, uh, whom we would really see as, as dangerous for, for Czech democracy. I mean, mo most of them are really quite harmless. I mean, just, just three days ago, I s spoke with a good friend of mine who believes in aliens and many uh, conspiracy theories related to them. Uh, and he's really a good guy who has no problem cooperating with, with, uh, uh, with the system in many regards. And, uh, uh, like he used to work in a in, in a hospital doing, doing some hard work that nobody else wanted to do and so on. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but he just holds some, some conspiracy th narratives, which means that currently he's labeled as this dangerous person uh, threatening the democratic order, which in fact he's, he's not. So I think we should try to include as many of these people as possible. Of course, there are some anti-systemic narratives that, that might be dangerous. And I think one, one criterion is, is that uh, <clears throat> we should check their ability to, to peacefully coexist with, with the mainstream narratives. Uh, and in fact, we, we find that in most cases, there is no, no problem with this, this peaceful uh, coexistence. So uh, that means that my conclusion is that we need a zone of legitimacy that, that is as wide as possible and whose boundaries are blurred and, and, and permeable. So there are many people who are sort of half pro-systemic and half anti-systemic, and, and that's fine. Uh, and uh, to demonstrate this, uh, uh, I, I've borrowed one slide from Peter Levine's presentation. 
which is, I think, about the very same thing, because uh, this, this is a slide about the, the, the community culture of disagreement. And what it shows is that uh, there is this large uh, center of agreement where uh, people can actually normally discuss things and, and agree upon many points. And then there are these marginal uh, areas where people do not agree. And what uh, we do nowadays, at least in my country, is that we start to focus on these, uh, on, on these marginal points, and we believe that, that these are really the, the crucial points that prevent any discussion. Whereas, as Peter has nicely shown, I think this, this is not, not the case. There are many other points where discussion is perfectly possible, and which allow this, this integration. Uh, and I think this is a really fine model of what, what this, this, this integration uh, with blurred boundaries might, might, might look like. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm really glad that, that uh, my lecture was, was, was able to connect to this, to this previous uh, talk by Peter Levine. And, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, now we have uh, time for some questions over there. Ano, děkuji. Já s dovolením položím otázku v českém jazyce. Přece jen se mi to tak formuluje lépe, když to není předem připravený příspěvek. Především bych chtěl velice ocenit věcný charakter toho příspěvku a řekl bych, a v jistém smyslu odvážení v některých partiích, což se dnes tak často neslyší. Přesto bych měl dvě takové nebo jednu poznámku a jeden, řekněme, dotaz. Pokud je o tu poznámku, ta se týká vlastně role nebo vztahu spíše pravdy a institucí. Já bych si přece jenom možná nedovolil říct, že věda je ta instituce, která nám určuje vlastně pravdu, byť i v sociologickém smyslu, protože dával bych přednost tomu gnoseologickému hledisku, že věda poznává pravdu a popravdě řečeno kolikrát ta věda byla i v rozporu s tím, co se později pravdou ukázalo, tak to je jenom taková poznámka a samozřejmě tím spíše se to týká jiných institucí, které by chtěly nebo mohly určovat pravdu. A ta, a ta otázka, ta se týká toho, možná, že mám, měl jsem někdy takový pocit, že se stotožňuje nebo že se příliš přibližuje určitá kategorie a její iluze. Když se podíváte třeba na tu, na tu kategorii charizmatů, na charismatickou autoritu. Ono popravdě řečeno, když by skutečně rost, rostla role opravdového charismatu ve srovnání s legální byrokracií, tak by se to muselo vidět také na vývoji osobností, třeba i v politické sféře, i ve vědecké sféře a podobně. Ale můžeme se ptát, kdo má dnes takové charisma jako Einstein. Můžeme se ptát, který politik západní má dnes takové charisma jako Churchill nebo De Gaulle a podobně. Čili je to samozřejmě je to věc, kterou lze nahlížet z velmi různých úhlů. Já jenom upozorňuji, že tenhle ten úhel je tady, je tady také a konečně to se týká i, co se týká tedy i toho vztahu, který potom na konci, na konci, na kon, byl, byl na konci řečen, ale rozhodně souhlasím s, tou, s tím, co řekl tady přednášející o delegitimizaci narrativů. Děkuji pěkně. 
Uh, okay, I'm, I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm not sure how to proceed with the English translation of, of, the, of, uh, of the question. I, th I think we can proceed to the answer in English, and hopefully our speakers or English speakers will, uh, <laughs> will infer yeah, so, what the so, question is. So I'll so briefly yeah. summarize each, 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 each question in English. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the first question uh, uh, concerned uh, the, the claim that even scientific narratives are socially constructed. Now, uh, th th this, of course, is a very complicated issue and, and uh, it, in, in a presentation su such as this one, I had to simplify it. So I know it's, it's uh, more complicated uh, uh, than that. And, and I'm not actually sure if I should go into all, all the details of, uh, uh, of, of the matter. So I'm certainly not, not saying that uh, the fact that scientific facts are socially constructed means that they do not uh, correspond to something uh, uh, real and, and that they are just made up by scientists. So that, that's not what I wanted to say. Uh, but I don't think we, we have space for, for, for explaining how, uh, uh, <clears throat> how, think, uh, how this, is, this is meant, because that, that would be a long dis discussion. So, so uh, <clears throat> I shall uh, uh, proceed to, to the other question. Uh, which expressed doubts concerning the fact that charismatic authority is, is growing, uh, because uh, you said that uh, previous uh, politicians, such as Winston Churchill, were frequently much more charismatic than, than today's politicians. Now, I don't dispute this, and I'm not, not really talking about uh, the personal charisma of, of each politician. Uh, I agree that, that mm, uh, there are not, not many mm, uh, politicians of this, this kind to, to today. I'm really talking about the public expectation and about the way public communication works. So nowadays, even those totally uncharismatic politicians have to communicate in a charismatic manner. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, sometimes this, this may seem ridiculous, in fact, uh, and so, you know, we, we've heard already that, that many of those advertising com political campaigns actually fail. Uh, but still, the expectation on both sides, both on the side of the politicians and on, on, on the side of, of the public, uh, is that, that uh, there needs to be this, this charismatic uh, <clears throat> communication. So, so uh, be, before the elections, all, all the parties try as hard as, as, as they can uh, <clears throat> uh, to, to do this. I mean, in, in my country, the, the presidential elections were, were a fine example where, where there were, in, in the end, there were three serious candidates, and one of them failed because the, the, the lady uh, did not seem authentic enough. And this, this, this was hard, uh, widely discussed on, uh, <clears throat> on Facebook and Twitter, and, 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 and people discussed. Uh, her authenticity and, and others were de de defending her and, and it was quite clear that, that this, this is an expectation that, that really dominated uh, the, the, the debate whereas the other uh, uh, candidate seemed more authentic and he, he was doing all these sophisticated marketing tricks like riding his, his motorcycle and, 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 and so on to seem authentic. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm not really talking about uh, uh, how politicians really are in terms of uh, authenticity and, 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 and charisma. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, our expectations in, in public communication. Položím otázku taky v češtině. Já bych se chtěl zeptat, jestli byste spíš potvrdil nebo odmítl pracovní tezi že to, čemu se říká rozkol, gap nebo rozpor nebo nedůvěra ve společnosti, tak jak o tom třeba vypovídá ten projekt Společnost nedůvěry prezentovaný Českým rozhlasem Institutu Syry, je spíše dáno tím, že část mainstreamu a elit pohrdá nebo dává na jeho nadřazenost nebo namyšlenost nad ostatní částí společnosti nebo nad tou protilehlou, anebo je to spíš dáno, řekl bych, bláznivostí, hysteričností, přehraností některých superkonspiračních jako narrativů a jejich touhletou jako stránkou. Jestli spíš byste ten důvod viděl 
na té straně mainstreamu a jeho, a to je ta teze namyšleného pohledu, anebo spíš na straně teda té bláznivosti některých šílených narrativů dezinformačních. Děkuji. Uh, okay, so, so the question is whether uh, the kind of polarization that, that, that I've been des describing is uh, rather caused uh, uh, by the conceited elites or by uh, some of those members of, of the anti-system anti which are too crazy in their conspiracy narratives. So I think that, 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 that can be the, the summary. Uh, <clears throat> I, I would say not, uh, not, neither of, of of this option is is is, is true for me. It, it it seems to me that that, that uh, the the underlying cause of, of the situation is uh, again this this complicated structural social dynamics of, of late modernity, which brings many uncertainties. I mean, the the, the previous era was very stable, predictable. Uh, you started to work in one company and you knew that, that uh, for the next 40 years you would be working there and then you would be under pension. And it, uh, it, it was a very stable in, in environment. Today's environment is, is highly unstable. Uh, <clears throat> and we all have to react to it uh, in one way or, or another. Uh, and some people uh, react to this in instability uh, by uh, uh, narrating conspiracy theories, others react by these attempts to, to build walls around the temperate narrative zone and, and sort of to safeguard the, the, the good old world as, as we knew it in, 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 in previous decades. So it seems to me that, that the cause uh, 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 is this, this common uncertainty and, and that uh, all, both groups are reacting to it uh, in, in that particular way. <laughs> we have time for one more question and it goes to the gentleman over there. Thank you for a very strong question and I would like to ask you a very strong question. Do you think that in this sphere of the area people are calling us our veřejnoprávní média, jako Česká televize, Český rozhlas, kde zaznívá většinou jenom jeden narrativ. A já znám spoustu lidí, kteří už vypnuli Českou televizi, Český rozhlas a posí, poslouchají přes nějaký, i přes televizi, třeba Xavera, televizi Xaver, paralelně a tak dále, přestávají poslouchat ta veřejnoprávní média, která si platíme ze svých peněz a která by měla prezentovat pro dobro společnosti všechny narrativy nebo alespoň ty přijatelné. Uh, okay, thank you. So the, the, the question uh, is whether I think uh, that one of the main causes of, of this situation is the behavior of uh, uh, Czech state media. Uh, and uh, uh, to some extent I would agree in the sense uh, that the Czech state media uh, uh, really see themselves as precisely those uh, last desperate defenders of, of the uh, <clears throat> temperate uh, narrative zone. Uh, and so they, they believe that uh, really saving Czech democracy is, is their task. Uh, so uh, some friends of mine have. Uh, experience with, with different types of media and they, they they actually do say that for instance in in Czech radio this uh, the ideological expectations are uh, much more radical than uh, in non-state media precisely because uh, these these uh, journalists in, in in Czech radio believe that uh, <clears throat> the, the task of saving Czech democracy really lies upon their shoulder and, and, and so, uh, while well, I was talking about fact checkers in my presentations, the, these uh, journalists in, in Czech radio and television certainly would, would fit into this group as, as well. Okay, well, thank you very much. I would like to thank Professor Chlup for the great simultaneous translation of the questions to the answers and the talk. Thank you.